Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Uh, as we begin our worship service this morning, if you are watching the worship service with someone else in your family or with friends, I encourage you to give the uh, exchange the green of peace with those folks. The peace that our Lord Jesus Christ won for us by his sacrifice on the cross and by his rising from the dead. We are Easter people, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, shed on the cross in payment for all of our sins, and given abundant life now and throughout eternity through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, which we celebrate in our Easter worship service this morning. And so we make our beginning that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I would invite you then to join in the responses with, under the heading of Confession and Absolution that you should have received with the hymns that we're using in this worship service today. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. We confess our shameful thoughts about our leaders, enemies, and strangers. We confess our inappropriate words spoken to our families, friends, and colleagues. We confess our inappropriate actions toward our neighbors. For the sake of the risen Christ, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may follow in his footsteps both now and when he returns in glory. Amen. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins. But Christ rose from the grave, and death no longer has dominion over him or us. God did this in accordance with the scriptures to forgive our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the risen Christ, and by his authority, I forgive your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our first hymn today is hymn number 457 in our hymnal, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. And we're playing just two verses once again. I'd encourage you to particularly look at the first two verses of the hymn. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Our first reading today is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43, where the Gentiles hear the good news. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through
through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him appear, not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson for today is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, where we are proclaimed to put on the new self. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds are thing, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel for the resurrection of our Lord is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first ten verses. And this morning I'm going to read those verses during the course of the sermon, which will come in just a few moments. At this time, I would invite you to join with me as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! This is my favorite day of the entire year. Doesn't matter whether it's at, at a time when we are all able to gather together and we have the Easter lilies sitting up in front and we have the choir singing and we have a sanctuary full of people or whether it is as it is today when we are not doing the right thing if we gather a whole lot of people together. But it is still my favorite day of the year and as a pastor, it is the most exciting day of the year because I once again have the privilege of proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Even though we don't have the Easter lilies or the choir singing or the opportunity to gather together with family, uh, there is something far more important about Easter and that is simply that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. I pray that for all of us who hear the message once again of that victory won for us by our Lord Jesus Christ, that this would be the central focus of our observance of Easter Sunday. I read not so long ago about one of the most spectacular characteristics that the Hollywood film industry has is the special effects 
that have such a prominent place in many movies that are filmed. And I wonder, how often have you walked out of a movie theater or, or finished watching a movie on TV and you were thinking to yourself, wow, how did they do that? The biggest stunt explosion in movie history was the 24th James Bond movie called Spectre. It's even listed in the Guinness Book of World Records. It, it's an impressive scene. It took over 2,000 gallons of kerosene, 300 detonators, 24 explosive devices, and a mountain of dust and debris to fake this spectacular explosion. Too bad that the Guinness Book of World Records wasn't around in Jesus' day because there is no special effect that can match the earth-shaking, tomb-opening visit from the angel on Easter morning. In fact, the shock waves of joy from that morning are still being felt all over the world. It is the most joyful event in the history of the entire human race. Alleluia, Christ is risen. And so since Ash Wednesday, which we observed on February 26, which seems such a long time ago, since Ash Wednesday we have not spoken or sung the word hallelujah in our worship services. And now today with churches and Christians all over the world, we have the opportunity to say that one special word together, hallelujah. It's a Hebrew word that means praise you, Lord. And so I invite you to say it with me now. Hallelujah! I, I couldn't hear you very well. So let's try that one more time. Hallelujah! That's better. Hallelujah is the ultimate Easter word. But to be honest, we would have to say that hallelujah was probably the last word that the women were thinking about as they headed to Jesus' tomb to anoint his broken body on that first Easter morning. And so we read from our text in Matthew chapter 28, beginning with the first verse. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Uh, remember that. The angel sat on the stone. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said, come see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. I wonder if you have noticed, as I have, that there are so many stories in the Bible of people waiting for God. They're waiting to hear God's voice, to receive God's provision, or to wait for his guidance. And so I think it's interesting that the Easter story is one of the few stories in the Bible where God waits for people. Can you picture the guards' faces when they see the angel descend from heaven and roll back the stone from Jesus' tomb with such power and the earthquake? Notice that the angels did not release Jesus from the tomb because he had already risen from the grave. The grave clothes were neatly folded and left behind. Jesus 
didn't need the angel's help. The angel rolled away the stone so that Jesus' visitors that morning could see inside the empty tomb and be assured that indeed he was not there because he had risen. And then the angel sat down on the stone. Just really fascinating to me. Why, why did the angel sit down on the stone? Surely, from what we know about angels, it was not because he was tired, but rather simply that the angel was sitting there waiting, waiting for the women to arrive. And imagine the women coming to the tomb in the early morning darkness, eyes that are swollen and tender from weeping, hearts that are breaking, no doubt. It's a journey that they had hoped they would never have to make. And so they walked to the tomb with heavy hearts, fearful perhaps of harassment by the guards, anxious, certain, about how they would move the stone, and grieving because the one who was the way, the truth, and the life was now dead and in the grave. And then they saw the angel waiting for them. And notice what the angel says. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. And my friends in Christ, there is absolutely nothing in human history that has been the same since that moment. Shock waves of joy are still reverberating across time, through the nations, into human hearts. It's interesting to me to read that Billy Graham once told the reporter for Time magazine, he said this, if I were an enemy of Christianity, I would aim right at the resurrection because that is the heart of Christianity. And it's true. Jesus' resurrection from the grave and his promise of eternal life for all those who put their trust in him is the very heart of Christianity. Some time ago, I read the story of a group of American soldiers who were stationed in London during the First World War. They had just received orders that the next day they would be going to the front lines. And the church where many of the men attended while away from home in a real hurry decided to give them a dinner. It was a joyous time, and the conversation was, was light and upbeat. Before the pastor gave the closing prayer, one of the soldiers was selected to share words of appreciation. He was chosen because he was a man of charm, and he had a gift of being able to speak publicly. And so, he said, tomorrow we are leaving for France and the trenches and to die. Later, he said he didn't mean to say that, looking around with embarrassment and struggling for some better words to say, he said, can anyone tell us how to die? The hall was quiet. Nobody laughed. Nobody even smiled. And there was an awkward pause as though he had said the wrong thing. And then a period of strange silence in which nobody said anything. And then one of the soldiers walked quietly to the piano where they had been playing and singing some of those fun songs. And he began to play and to sing some well-known hymns. Among them, Jesus Christ is risen today. And a hymn that you're going to hear in a few moments, I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the quiet that followed, every man was forced to deal in a serious way with the question of life and death. And so without anybody planning it, a party became kind of a prayer meeting in which these men turned to God. Easter gives you and me, my friends, the opportunity without being morbid, but simply to reflect on the ultimate meaning of things. Are we 
mere creatures of the dust who are here only for a short time or were we cre created for eternity. Brothers and sisters, we were created for eternity to live with our Lord forever. The resurrection was a victory of God's love over sin. It was a victory of life over death. A victory of peace over anxiety, a victory of hope over despair. Even in the times in which we live now, with so many people fearful of what's going to happen to them in the midst of COVID-19, with, with many people anxious about their jobs, some who have lost their jobs or have been furloughed or had their pay cut, wondering how they're going to be able to survive. The good news of the gospel is that Christ remains with his people through even such difficult times as these, and he promises us the final victory which he won over all of our enemies. And that victory that we could never win for ourselves because of sin, that victory is our victory as we believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and for life everlasting. Today and every day is Easter for believers in Jesus. And once we grasp something of the power of his resurrection, we live the rest of our lives with the fullness of God's grace found in that empty tomb. Hallelujah! Christ is risen and he lives forevermore. Praise the Lord. Amen. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep our hearts and our minds in the risen Christ Jesus. Amen. this morning, we offer special petitions on behalf of Helene, a Marty Zero's sister who is in home hospice care at this time. We also pray for their daughter, Kirsten, as she is involved in health care in New Jersey. And we pray for all first responders and those who are involved in the many, many hospitals throughout our land at this time. We pray also for our government officials who are really have the responsibility of making important decisions for the well-being of the citizens of our country. We pray for God's will to be carried out in terms of providing our congregation with a pastor as it would seem that that individual is going to come straight from our seminary in St. Louis. And so rejoicing in the resurrection of our Lord and sharing in his peace, let us pray to the Lord on behalf of ourselves and all people as they have need. Gracious Heavenly Father, on this Easter celebration, we thank and praise you for the marvelous victory that your Son, Jesus Christ, won over sin, over death, and over Satan. 
And even as we experience the joy of his resurrection, we pray that you would give us confidence that one day we too will rise from the dead to life everlasting, that our sins are forgiven, that we have the sure and certain promise that you will be with us each moment of every day, no matter what the circumstances that may face us in life. You, we, you have the ability, O oh Lord, through the working of your Holy Spirit, to make us to burn with the fire of your love, that we may love you above all things, and that we might love our neighbors as ourselves. Deliver us, O oh Lord, from fear, and relieve the anxiety of our hearts, that we may live out fully the hope planted within us, and the new lives we received in the waters of our baptism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you look upon your people with comfort, with encouragement, with hope, and with healing. And so today we pray your blessing upon those who are suffering illnesses, whether it be a body, mind, or a spirit. We ask that you would stand at their side, that you would extend your healing hand upon them, and that you would restore them to health and strength once again. Pray your blessing upon the caregivers for those who have fallen victim to COVID-19. Grant them the assurance of your presence. Give them the strength to bear the burdens of the work that they do. We pray that you would be with the scientists who continue to work to develop a vaccine that will protect people from COVID-19. Be with the first responders and with all those who are involved in dealing with this crisis in our land. Pray that you would stand at their side and that you would watch over them. Especially we lift up to you Kirsten, Marty and Sherry's daughter, as she is involved in health care, sustain her at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O risen Savior, we pray that you would hear us on behalf of our President, our Governor, the Congress of the United States, and all state and local elected officials. Guide them according to your word, that their labors for our nation's health and welfare may not be in vain, nor forgetful of the vulnerable, aging, and unemployed. We pray especially, O oh Lord, that you would be with those who have some, some fear about what is going to happen and that their jobs have gone away or their hours have been reduced, their pay has been cut. Give them the confidence that you will attend to their needs as you alone can. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, we lift up to you our congregation, O oh Lord. You know that for some time we have been seeking your will to direct us to that individual whom you would have served as the next under-shepherd of your flock here at Oak Brook. And so we pray your blessing upon those who make decisions in regard to the placement of graduates from the seminary and vicars who will soon be uh, going out into the field. Lead them to uh, select that individual who is served here according to your will. And so we entrust that to your care and direction for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It has been over a month now since we have celebrated the sacrament of the Lord's Supper here in our sanctuary. We are living through a very unique time in our country with the COVID-19 lockdown that prevents us from gathering together in God's house and thus to have the opportunity to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. That is one reason that we are celebrating the sacrament this morning in a unique way. The second reason is this, the power and the validity of the sacrament is not at all dependent upon the place where we administer the sacrament it does not have to be in this church building. And furthermore, the power and the validity of the sacrament is not at all dependent on whose hand it is that gives the bread and the wine and with it the body and blood of our Lord to you. In normal times, that would be me as your pastor and the elders who would distribute the elements of the sacrament to you. But these are not normal times. And so this morning, it will be your hands who distribute the elements of the sacrament to yourself and to your family. 
For it is the words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself that gives the power and the validity of the sacrament. And those words are given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And so we are assured of forgiveness, life, and salvation by the power of God's word. And I would simply say this, if anyone feels uncomfortable receiving the sacrament this morning in this unique way, you surely understand this. You would refrain from participating in it. But if you have your bread and wine and wish to receive the sacrament, I'm now going to speak the words of consecration of the elements and then the words of distribution. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my true body, given into death for all of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given and shed for the forgiveness of all your sins. And may the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We do give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in firm and love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive then the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.